All right, well, then let's forget scruples, because, Tali, this is not about who's a good guy, who's an honorable person. I want to remove ourselves from the shock department and go to the legal department. Mm -hmm. Anything we have heard tonight, does any of it matter? Because the only things that matter are winning elections and following the law. Of course. <laughs> so, obviously, what rang in my ear, Stephanie, is when Steve Scalise says about Matt Gates, it may actually be illegal what he's doing. And I, I think that's important for two reasons. First of all, it it tells us that there may actually be some evidence of incitement here or give courage to prosecutors who may be looking at incitement charges around January 6th and the days afterwards. Uh, because one of the things that's so hard about an incitement case is to show a likelihood that the things you said may actually lead to violence. Well, here we have two Republican members of Congress saying, well, we're actually worried here. Ah. We saw them bring a rope to Congress. This is a really volatile time. Why is he throwing a match you know, into this really volatile situation? It might go up into flames. The other is that it tells me a little bit about how they understood January 6th. You know, they had been warned. We now know we're going to get to the, to the subject of the text messages from Meadows that things may really be dangerous here. And they might have believed that on that day as well. Then do you think tapes like this would matter to Merrick Garland? I am sure that he's listening to them. I hope that he's watching. Uh, Michael, one person who has actually be. been pretty muted thus far about McCarthy is Trump. But tonight, Tucker Carlson, let it rip. Watch this. Unless conservatives get their act together right away, Kevin McCarthy or one of his highly liberal allies like Elise Stefanik is very likely to be Speaker of the House in January. That would mean we will have a Republican Congress led by a puppet of the Democratic Party. Highly liberal allies, Elise Stefanik, who, who took Liz Cheney down. I mean, that is tr pure crazy town. OK, but, but, but in all seriousness, if you've got this leakathon going and you've got Tucker Carlson going after him, does McCarthy have a real chance to be the speaker if Republicans win? Or is this just crushing him? It's, you know, I think there's still a little bit more drama to get played out here. You know, little Tuckums is doing his thing yeah, for the cause, for sure. Uh, the reality of it is, you know, this, it's interesting watching this worm turn um, for Kevin McCarthy the way it has. Um, and, and, and the fact of the matter is, it goes back to my earlier point. There is no love inside this wing of the Republican Party, this this sort of pool, a cesspool of, of political characters for someone like Kevin McCarthy, nor is it for uh, Elise Stefanik, whom they all praised and patted on the back for the purposes of showing uh, Liz Cheney the exit, right? But again, this is all a very tenuous transactional relationship, very much in the Trump mold. And to the extent it stops being a transaction that's favorable to your, your narrative, your messaging, and the money that you're grifting off of it, you know, you better believe a Tucker Carlson is going to go on Fox and start saying the crazy you heard tonight. Claire, what do you think is happening within the Republican Party? Because for the most part, during the four years when Trump was in office, despite what they have they may have said privately, they held their nose and they stood behind him as their fearless leader. Are we seeing things change publicly here? I mean, these aren't Democrats leaking these tapes. Listen, um, here's what Kevin McCarthy had a front row seat for. He had a front row seat when the extreme element of their caucus ran John Boehner out of the speakership. Mm. He had a front row seat when that same element in their caucus ran Paul Ryan out of the speakership. He has watched what happens when you try to tangle with the most vicious and extreme elements of his party. And now Tucker Carlson has taken up a weapon against him. Now, watch Sean Hannity carefully, because that will tell you where Trump is. And I think if Kevin McCarthy thinks cozying up to these guys is going to help him, uh, I fear he might be mistaken and he might go the same road that Boehner and Paul Ryan went. But, Claire, again, these weren't bipartisan meetings. These are Republicans taping one another. Did you tape your former Democratic colleagues when you were a member of Congress? No, I did not. 
<laughs> no need. Um, but there were also staff on the, some of these calls. So that's why it's going to be very hard for McCarthy mm. to figure out who is the guilty party here. I don't think Liz Cheney would do this. I frankly don't think a member would do this. But I think a staffer who is was freaked out at the fear that was palpable in the House chamber when shots rang out and someone was killed right outside the doors to the House of Representatives. I think the staff that work there were traumatized by that. And I think they have continued to be very upset behind the scenes over the failure of the Republican Party to take it seriously. Michael, is there a chance these leaks are actually stealing the January 6th committee's thunder? If these are their big ahas, that's going to be a big uh-oh when it comes to public hearings. No, I, I think quite the contrary. I think these leaks should be adding more fuel to their fire. I think these leaks should should be uh, clear, clarifying what steps they should be taking, uh, not just for the January 6th commission, but also for the DOJ. I mean, Stephanie, how much smoke does this gun have to admit before there are consequences? I mean, we're tiptoeing around tonight, you know, the chairman of the committee, you know, with all due respect saying, well, you know, in all probability, we'll likely ask, you know, the speaker to, to I mean, uh, Kevin to come before the committee again. No, issue that damn subpoena at first thing in the morning. I mean, why are we playing nice? Because these people have positions inside of government. All of us on this panel would not be treated with the with the idea that we can just show up if we feel good that day or if we may or may not have something to say. I mean, I, so this part of it is frustrating for a lot of Americans who want to know exactly what happened, but more importantly, whose fingers were on the triggers that caused Americans to riot against its government. And I think this commission has a responsibility right now on this evidence. There are more tapes coming next week when this book comes out. So, I mean, this should be perfect fuel to give them the impetus to do what they need to do and for the DOJ to look at all of this collectively uh, and say, hmm, I think we're going to have to fill out some forms here and send around some paper. Fill out some forms. Tali, you're the legal expert. What do you think? Uh, you know, I think that every day we are seeing the atmosphere around this grow. Uh, you know, I think we're all still sorting through those text messages from Mark Meadows, and we're seeing them resonant with what we've just been talking about tonight, right? More evidence that there was real fear on that day. There was awareness that there was going to be violence on that day, and importantly, some connections to the president that up until now have been quite slippery. But Tali, you've devoted your career to being mm -hmm. a civil servant. If in the end, mm -hmm. none of this matters, if in the end there are no consequences, what does that say about our government? Mm -hmm. I'm not willing to answer that question, Stephanie, <laughs> because you yourself said there are multiple ways for people to be held accountable for this kind of behavior, both through the political process and through enforcing the law and accountability. And now what we are seeing is evidence, audio recordings, text messages, those are the best kinds of evidence. And we've waited a long time for them. Folks have been sitting on them, and now they're starting to come out. Then I know I'm out of time, but Claire, I have to ask, then from the political process standpoint, at this point, should Democrats be immediately turning all of this into campaign ads? And does this kind of content get undecided, motiva undecided voters motivated to show up in November? Probably not. Um, I do think that there is an obligation of the commission to do really good public hearings where they very clearly lay out the mountains of evidence. But I do think what the Democratic Party should be doing is talking about things like inflation and talking about job creation and talk about the things that they did in the infrastructure bill and to make sure people understand that signing up for the Republican Party is not signing up to help people do better economically around their kitchen table. Claire, you know you are always welcome to come on the show when you want to talk about economic issues and kitchen table issues, because that's what gets people to We vote. need to talk about you. I want to come back and talk about the SPAC that funded Truth Social, where all the money went, and can Elon Musk ever make Twitter a successful?